I'd like to just introduce um, our second and final round table of the day on um, the historical legacy of the Balfour Declaration. And again, like the first panel, we have um, three speakers and a very powerful chair who will direct the discussion. Um, so on this panel, we have um, uh, Rana Barakat uh, from uh, Burzeit uh, University. Um, and Rana Barakat is Assistant Professor of History and Contemporary Arab Studies at Burzeit. She is the author of Criminals or Martyrs Let the Courts Decide, British Colonial Legacy in Palestine and the Criminalization of Resistance. And that was published in 2013. We have Jacob Norris from Sussex University. And Jacob Norris is a lecturer in Middle Eastern history at the, at the University of Sussex. And his latest book is Land of Progress, Palestine in the Age of Colonial Development, 1905 to 1948. And finally, we have Lauren Banco from Manchester University also in the UK. And Lauren is a postdoctoral research fellow in Arab, Arabic and Middle Eastern history. Her latest book, which she, um, she launched with us about 18 months ago, is called The Invention of Palestinian Citizenship, 1918 to 1947. Um, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Raja Shahada, who you'll all know as a very well-known uh, Palestinian author and lawyer who will chair the session and uh, direct the discussion. Um, thank you for your participation, and I hope you enjoy the second panel. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, we, we agreed to conduct this session differently from the last session. The way we will do it is uh, I will not repeat the introduction to the uh, uh, speakers because you already have heard that. I will just mention the title of each of them, and then they will speak in succession. And I will uh, give a brief introduction. And, and after they finish, I will have a few questions that I will ask from myself and then open the discussion to, the, to, to, to you, the audience. So we will start with uh, Jacob Norris, the title of whose uh, presentation is Belfour and the Imperial Imagination, and then uh, Lauren Banco, whose title is the Palestinian Palestine Mandate and Colonial Conceptions of Race and Nationality, and uh, Rana Barakat would be the third, and she will speak on Palestine and Palestinians around the Belfort frenzy, indigenous historical narratives. When I was in high school, we used to study the Belfort Declaration, which was referred to as the Wa'ad al Mash'oom, uh, loosely in, uh, interpreted or translated as the cursed promise. But having described it as such, we never went further to study its legacy and manner of implementation. It was as though the responsibility of the British for all our troubles in Palestine began and ended merely with the declaration. Years later, I read the preamble, really for the first time, of the British mandate over Palestine, 1922, which clearly said, after the preamble, uh, which uh, you have heard already, it said in Article 2, the mandate the mandatory shall be responsible for placing the country under such political, administrative, and economic conditions as will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home, as laid down in the preamble. I saw how it was all there, that the resident debtor of the mandate was the establishment of a Jewish home in a country where we, the Palestinian Arabs, were referred to as the non-Jewish community in Palestine. I then, then realized that the outcome in Palestine should have come as no surprise. The British who ruled over the country were to actively contribute to the establishment of the Jewish homeland. It was the exact same feeling that I had when I read the Israeli military orders in the late 70s, and I could see laid out in clear language and great detail all what the Israeli authorities were planning to carry out in the rest of Palestine that they occupied in 1967. It might well have been that Israel believed it had a mandate, one that it gave itself, 
or more probably closer to their thinking, God Almighty gave them to extend the sovereignty of their country to the rest of Palestine. The attention that has been given to the anniversary of the Balfour Declaration and the extensive attempts from different quarters at getting an apology from the government of the country that made this declaration has been outstanding. Yet scant attention has been given to later developments and other responsibilities of the British following the declaration, such as their severe and cruel suppression of the 1936 Arab revolt in Palestine and their departure from Palestine without first ensuring protection, which according to the 1947 UN partition scheme were to be given to the uh, Arab states, to the Arab states such as Jaffa and Akka. The excessive attention that was given the Balfour Declaration has made me think how we often forget that all we're talking about is a mere declaration. Since then, there have been so many declarations from powerful states, sometimes favorable to the Palestinians, and groups of states that have come to nothing. It doesn't mat much matter what they are called, assurances, memoranda of understanding, motions, or declarations. They can come to nothing unless other factors exist. So more important than the document itself is what follows and what is made of it. This is our subject this afternoon, the historical legacy of the Balfour Declaration. And we'll start by hearing from Jacob Norris on the subject. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Raja. It's very good to be here. Thank you to all of the organizers and thank you to all for, for coming. What I want to do in my short talk is put a sense of the empire, the British Empire, and imperialist ideology back into our understanding of the Balfour Declaration and its legacy in Palestine. So I'm gonna build on, follow on from some of the themes that were raised in the first panel. I think for very understandable reasons, we tend to think about the Balfour Declaration within the relatively narrow confines of the Palestinian Zionist confrontation. But what that also does is it blinds us, I think, sometimes to the much broader imperialist currents that provide the kind of ideological and cultural backdrop to its formation and then its implementation in Palestine. Um, and I think because of that relatively narrow view that we often have of Britain in Palestine, we, we have this kind of overriding impression of Britain being a, a kind of a referee caught between two warring sides. The debates rage about which side it might have favored more than the other, um, but we don't necessarily have a sense of actually those imperialist motivations that are driving British policy, not just for the Balfour Declaration, but crucially that question which Roberto has raised of why is it that the Declaration makes its way into the terms of the mandate? And Roberto's right to say that's still an un understudied question, as surprising as that might be. Uh, and for me, to, to understand this, we need to have an understanding of the specific appeal of Zionism to a new generation of imperialists, British imperialists, who were coming into influence and into the British government during the First World War. These are men, they were actually nicknamed at the time the new imperialists, and they believed in a much more, they believed in the need for a much more integrated type of British empire in which resources were extracted on a more kind of systematic basis, uh, and that investment was needed in the empire in order to make use of those resources. They had generally received their colonial education in South Africa um, under the guidance of Alfred Milner, who was the high commissioner in South Africa at the end of the 19th century. And ideologically speaking, their father figure was a man called Joseph Chamberlain, who was British colonial secretary right at the end of the 19th century. And Chamberlain, in particular, espoused this idea of exploiting or tapping into what he called the undeveloped estates of the British Empire. I'll come back to that phrase a bit later. But just to give you a flavor of Chamberlain and his ideas, I'm gonna quote very briefly from a speech he made in the 1890s to, a, to a, a meeting in Birmingham in the UK. And he said, speaking to British people, there's no article of your food, no raw material of your trade, no necessity of your lives, which cannot be produced somewhere or other in the British Empire. So we just bear that kind of philosophy or ideology in mind. The key thing 
in the First World War is that the war itself brings these ideologies to the forefront of British policymaking. It makes them seem much more attractive because, of course, the war mobilizes millions of troops and laborers from all across the British Empire, as well as all sorts of resources, other types of economic resources. And so that really strengthens the arguments of these new imperialists. And we see when, the, when a new government is formed in Britain at the end of 1916, under the new Prime Minister Lloyd George, many of these new imperialists suddenly appear in the government. There are lots of them, but the, the key ones, the key people I just want to flag up here is Alfred Milner himself, who I mentioned in the South African context. He becomes one of the five-man war cabinet, a key, key uh, shaper of British policy for the rest of the war. And then three what were called assistant secretaries in the war cabinet. Mark Sykes, who you'll be familiar with from Sykes-Picot, um, Leo Amory, and William Ormsby Gore. These aren't, so these aren't necessarily household names, but actually if you look at the drafting of the Balfour Declaration and the many drafts that went through, these were the men who were actually writing the declaration, obviously in conversation with, with Lloyd George and Balfour, but these are the people who, in a way, crafted the words of the declaration in, in, in consultation with Zionists and Weizmann in particular. But then they also, particularly Ormsby Gore and Leo Amory, they went on to dominate British colonial policy making for the rest of the interwar years. Firstly, Alfred Milner is colonial secretary. He's followed by Churchill, but then after Churchill, we see Leo Amory becomes colonial secretary, and in the 30s, William, William Ormsby Gore. So I'm putting the focus here more on the policy makers in Whitehall itself who are directing colonial policy. They all uh, helped draft the Balfour Declaration. They were all ardent admirers of Zionism. <clears throat> and to understand that, I think we need to see their broader vision of the Middle East. They saw the Middle East during the First World War as an exciting new frontier for British colonialism, um, a frontier that was rich in natural resources. Um, Mesopotamia, or Iraq in particular, was viewed as the jewel of the crown, not just for its, the emerging knowledge of its oil reserves, but also for the view of its enormous potential for agricultural production. But Palestine, too, was part of their vision of this new future British Middle East, not just as the Mediterranean outlet for Iraqi oil, and that's where Haifa becomes such a crucial city in the British imagination during the First World War, but Palestine also as a region rich potentially in natural resources. We have to understand that in the years of the First World War, there was emerging knowledge of oil reserves across the Middle East, but not yet concrete knowledge of where exactly those reserves were located, and it was often thought that Palestine and the Dead Sea region in particular was oil rich. But of course, to realize these kind of quite grandiose colonial ambitions, you need capital and you need labor. And this is where the attraction to Zionism comes in. It was viewed very much by all of these men as a very useful kind of colonial intermediary that was ready to provide this kind of very science, scientific, technological-based approaches to agriculture, to resource extraction, to infrastructure. But also, I think we need to understand it wasn't necessarily unique to Zionism, right? So at this point in time, Britain is experimenting with all sorts of ideas of moving around uh, groups of populations around the empire in order to spur what they called colonial development. We see it in plans to settle hundreds of thousands of Punjabi Indians in Iraq, through the period 1915-16. These plans weren't realized, but they were drawing up plans to do so. We see it in the movement of Maltese settlers to Cyprus, to Egypt. Maltese often have this status in British imagination as a very useful colonial intermediary. And we could, we could trace it back earlier to the, to the migration of millions of indentured Indian, South Asian laborers, particularly to East Africa and the Caribbean. This idea that you, you, you move around certain groups in order to boost productivity, in order to boost uh, modernization um, and development. So this is how I think the key colonial policymakers in Whitehall viewed Zionism, I and this explains their, assistant, their insistence that the Balfour Declaration was incorporated into the terms of the mandate years. And in terms of those, the final terms of the mandate itself, Article 11 gives you the kind of key to this line of thinking. Article 11 states, the administration may arrange with the Jewish agency to construct or operate any public works, services, and utilities insofar as these matters are not directly undertaken by the administration. So this idea that that is the key role, in a way, of Zionism within the British colonial 
imperialist mindset. And that last line about not directly undertaken by the administration becomes increasingly important as the mandate years wear on, and it becomes clear there are no central funds um, from the British government to carry out their ambitions in Palestine, and therefore it's the role of the Zionist movement to do that. <clears throat> And despite the obvious uh, failures of British policies and objectives in Palestine, it's actually often overlooked that Zionism performed this function quite successfully for British imperial interests, especially with regards to natural resources and infrastructure. Now, the clearest examples here would be Haifa, which becomes the biggest and most important British um, naval uh, and economic base in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, but, and, and of course the outlet for Iraqi oil. But none of that would have been possible without the web of Zionist industrial infrastructure that is surrounding Haifa, as well as the production of, for example, electricity. So one example there would be the concessions given to Pinhas Rutenberg in 1921 to generate masses amounts of electricity um, in Palestine. And I would say the clearest example of Zionism being a success from the British imperialist perspective is the Dead Sea Works, which were established formally in 1930, uh, a concession given to another Russian Zionist entrepreneur, a man called Moshe Novomeysky, uh, who established a new company with this concession, the Palestine Potash Limited, it was called, but it was a Zionist-run company, but based in London, with, uh, in the terms of its concession, it was stated that in times of emergency, the British government had the right to co-opt and redirect its exports. And this is exactly what happened during the Second World War. So if you fast forward to, to the 1940s, Britain is importing over half of its potash from Palestine. Potash is an essential ingredient in agricultural fertilizers, um, which is vital to the war effort as well as um, peacetime agricultural production. And if you look across the empire, Britain also managed to divert the exports of the Dead Sea products, the minerals that were being extracted from the Dead Sea waters, to many other imperial territories. So in the empire as a whole, 80% of the British Empire potash was provided by Palestine during the years of the Second World War. And these kind of projects generate massive enthusiasm amongst people espousing that kind of new imperialist ideology back in Britain itself. Just to give you a flavor of that enthusiasm, a quote from the Sunday Times in 1930 when the concession was granted to this Zionist enterprise. And it says, no greater commercial enterprise in natural resources has been consummated in recent years than that which now gives to a British corporation control of one of the world's biggest and most valuable stretches of untapped riches yet remaining undeveloped. So what we're seeing there by the 1930s is actually the very enactment of Chamberlain's ideas that I mentioned earlier of the undeveloped estates. And just to finish, I think it's worth noting that this specific role assigned to Zionism by this kind of British imperialist vision was absolutely crucial for the outcome of the 1948 war and the expulsion of the Palestinians. To put it bluntly, if you control all of a country's natural resources as well as its infrastructure and the production of energy, you are massively advantaged in any kind of military confrontation. And I think this has to stand as one of the major legacies of the Balfour Declaration and its incorporation into the terms of the mandate. From the perspective of Britain's new imperialists, the declaration was the starting point for a new kind of colonial laboratory that was very much governed by hierarchies of race that saw Jews as useful intermediaries and Arabs as charming yet ultimately backward natives. And just in case you're in any doubt about this, I'm going to leave you with the words of Winston Churchill, who's already been quoted by Evie Schleim today. But in 1921, when the British Parliament was debating the uh, Rutenberg concession, in the House of Commons, Churchill made this statement. He said, left to themselves, the Arabs of Palestine would not in a thousand years have introduced electrification to Palestine. They would have been quite content to dwell a handful of philosophic people in the wasted, sun-scorched plains, letting the waters of the Jordan continue to flow unbridled and unharnessed into the Dead Sea. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Now to, to Lauren. Okay. Thank you, Raja, for the, for the introduction. And I'll just think again, the organizers of the conference and also those who volunteered to help today and 
those of you who stuck around to see the second panel um, and took time out of your day to do so. So thank you all for, for coming. Um, my talk is going to somewhat um, relate to, to some of the topics raised in the first panel and also to what Jacob has just said in regards to looking a little bit more at the mandate itself as an instrument uh, which implemented the Balfour Declaration because essentially it is the mandate and the terms of the mandate charter, but it's also um, <clears throat> a number of international treaties, British implemented legislation that was passed in London for Palestine, um, orders in council, other certain things that were the tools to implement the Balfour Declaration in Palestine before 1948. And one thing I wanted to, um, to just mention, there seems to be a, a debate among some British or Anglophile historians of Palestine or Zionism in Palestine, which it's not an old debate at all. I mean, it, it's also quite new. Um, and I, I hate to bring up James Renton again, whose ears must be burning from the first panel. Um, but he also makes this claim that in 1917 and even into 1920, British policymakers didn't see the Zionist movement as a statist project, that they instead saw the Zionist movement as, as a national movement, a form of nationalism, but which didn't have aims of implementing statehood institutions in Palestine. Um, and so again, this is an argument that's, that's made you know, very currently now, and I think the keynote from uh, Professor Schleim did quite a bit to chip away at this argument. Um, but part of what my talk is going to focus on are the ways in which the mandate and other legislative tools implemented Balfour through a particular understanding, an imperial understanding of race and citizenship. Um, and the ways in which these understandings of race and citizenship helped to produce what was essentially a settler colonial society in Palestine, sort of mediated by the British <clears throat> before, 19, uh, before 1948. But these understandings um, of race and imper or, or imperial understandings of race and nationality sort of stem from the late 19th century and are inherited by the mandate as well. <clears throat> and historically, the British conception of race and nationality at the time of Balfour, and which was embedded not only into the mandate, but also into the treaties that served to end the First World War, that served to carve up the Ottoman Empire, uh, create the mandate system in general, um, <clears throat> They're very much framed around, as the earlier panelists have said, seeing the Jewish people as a particular racialized category and linking race uh, with nationality. <clears throat> and at the same time, the Zionist movement is also helping to encourage the British to view the Jewish people in Europe, so specifically the Ashkenazi Jewish communities in Europe as a separate race or as a separate nation. Um, and so, again, this was mentioned in, in the first panel a little bit, you have members of the Zionist movement looking over drafts of the mandate, drafts of the Balfour Declaration. When we talk about how settler colonialism allowed the Balfour Declaration to be implemented in Palestine, citizenship and offering a certain nationality or citizenship, um, the terms were interchangeable for a while, specifically to Jewish immigrants, was really the main tool uh, to implement the process of settler colonialism. And so you have, as early as 1920, um, Heim Weizmann and others in the prominent leaders of uh, the Zionist movement in London secretly viewing drafts of what later became Palestine citizenship or nationality law, making comments upon it. Um, many of those comments were actually taken into consideration by those who drafted the law. Um, and so the draft in 1920 was not what the British published in 1925 as a citizenship law. Um, what came out in 1925 was very heavily influenced by what certain members of the Zionist movement felt was necessary to put into citizenship in order to allow Jewish immigrants to have perhaps not necessarily precedence over the native or indigenous Arab population who mostly automatically became citizens, but to at least have parity with them. <clears throat> And one thing I do, I'll go over first um, somewhat briefly, is just uh, a 
mention of some of the most important parts of the Mandate Charter itself that link to this idea um, of settler colonialism and also which facilitated the need for a certain type of settler colonial citizenship uh, for the Jewish immigrants in Palestine. And one thing to, to bring up first and foremost is that the very first article of the Mandate very much gave the British complete oversight over all administrative and legislative matters in Palestine. So the British, from the, the get-go, uh, as they drafted the mandate, made sure to, to stress that it would be them rather than anyone else who had um, <clears throat> ultimate oversight as to what happened legislatively. Of course, the, the fourth article of the mandate, and I'm not sure how many of you are so fluent with the mandate itself, but it's the fourth article that allows the Jewish agency, well, what later becomes the Jewish agency, but allows the Zionist movement to cooperate with the British, to offer suggestions, um, essentially to lobby the British to make any changes or implement any sorts of orders in council or laws in Palestine that would affect the Jewish community. So while the British are at the top of things, the Zionist movement has very much a privileged position that the Arab population has absolutely nothing uh, similar to that in being able to advise Great Britain in matters related to the Jewish national homeland. And it's really the sixth article of the mandate, which is the one that um, <clears throat> establishes that the British will facilitate Jewish immigration to Palestine under certain conditions and ultimately establish, or not establish, um, <clears throat> ensure close settlement of Jewish immigrants on the land of Palestine itself, as long as that settlement and immigration doesn't prejudice the Arab civil and religious rights. Uh, and so this essentially is the endorsement of settler colonialism. Through Article 6, the British are inviting Jewish immigrants to come and settle in Palestine and are encouraging them to do so. Um, and that article leads to the need for the article that follows it, which is the seventh article of the mandate, um, to establish a nationality or a citizenship law. And that law was specifically meant to confer Palestinian citizenship to Jewish immigrants and to Jewish residents in Palestine. And also to disallow illegal immigration, to disallow settlement of Jewish immigrants who don't become citizens. Um, and also, this um, <clears throat> article, which later on was, was taken up and becomes the, um, the citizenship order, made very clear that Arabs from other parts of, of the former Ottoman Empire would not be able to come to Palestine and settle and take on citizenship. Um, and then, of course, as Jake mentioned, Article 11 on, on the British having full uh, power to, to um, control natural resources. Within Article 11 as well, the British promised to introduce a land system for close settlement of Jewish, immigration, or <clears throat> of Jewish immigrants. And so this is essentially the mandate text in 1920, and it becomes ratified in the years to follow, and then eventually is, is fully passed by the League of Nations and is implemented. But in between that time, there's a couple of international treaties that also go a bit of a ways towards um, similarly framing ideas of race and nationality for the former Ottoman Empire. The first one is the Treaty of Sev, which as some of you know, wasn't implemented in the end, um, but which was drawn up in 1920 and set the precedent for the types of nationality laws that would have to be implemented, not only in Palestine, but in the other mandates. And so the ways in which the British operated in Palestine and drafted their mandate also had to conform with what the League of Nations and what these international treaties were saying as well. Um, I won't go too much into the 1920 treaty, except to say there was um, <clears throat> an article in that treaty that uh, specified that people who were habitually resident in parts of the Ottoman Empire, who differed in race, and the word race was used, um, who differed in race from the majority of the population in the new states in which they were settled, had the option to move somewhere else um, where the majority race was the same as theirs. Um, <clears throat> so in other words, an Arab in certain parts of, of the former Ottoman territory, say Armenia, would be able to move 
to other parts of the Ottoman Empire, former Arab parts of the Ottoman Empire, um, in order to sort of link their racial category with what would become their nationality. But Palestine was excluded from this provision. So Arabs from elsewhere would not be able to move to Palestine and become part of the national body of, of the territory. Um, but of course, the Treaty of Sev was not implemented. And what is implemented is the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. Um, which includes the same sort of proviso for minority rights, for trying to link race and, and nationality together. Um, but this time, in the Treaty of Lucerne, there was the allowance for anyone who was a minority in the state they were settled in to move to another territory in which they would be part of the racial majority. Um, and at the same time, the Treaty of Lucerne uh, sort of piggybacked alongside the mandate and stated that... Um, <clears throat> non-Turkish or non-Ottoman Jews in Palestine would have automatic nationality once there was a law within Palestine to, to allow for that. And so when the British came to devise their own nationality order, they had to also conform with sort of the time limits and other restrictions that were placed on the transfer of nationality from these international treaties. And what the, the British did first and foremost in the early 1920s was give all Jewish immigrants a sort of provisional citizenship or kind of permanent residency status. Um, and in 1922, those Jewish immigrants who were provisional citizens were allowed to vote in what became sort of the failed legislative council, um, whereas the Arabs were seen as still Ottoman citizens. <clears throat> And in large part, it was also, this is also linked to the belief in Europe and in Britain that Ashkenazi Jews and religious Jews in Europe were alike enough to compose their own nation. And so if they came to Palestine, they would be given Palestinian citizenship as soon as a law were passed to do so. And that law was passed in 1925. Um, and again, the reason sort of for the law was simply to give Jewish immigrants Palestinian citizenship. And with that citizenship, they then had access to political rights, civil rights, such as voting in municipal councils, um, local councils, local government administration. But the citizenship order that came into being, as I said earlier, was very much influenced by the Zionist observations on the drafts of it. And so one of the main things that was changed from the early drafts of the citizenship order into 1925 and the amendments that followed um, were that residency was to become a condition of nationality. Um, so birth alone in Palestine was not enough to make someone a Palestinian citizen. So in other words, if there were Arabs who were born in Ottoman Palestine, who left for whatever reason, um, whether for work, business, study, and were outside of the territory for a certain number of years, just because they were born there was not enough of a connection in the minds of the British imperialists who framed this nationality law to grant them automatic citizenship. Whereas Jewish immigrants, if they could prove they'd been resident for two years in Palestine, they were able to naturalize after 1925. Those who had been there before were granted a sort of automatic ipso facto um, nationality. Um, Jewish immigrants had, like I said, the only two years necessary to, of residence to actually naturalize as citizens. Um, which was very different from other mandates and also from other British imperial territories and Great Britain itself, where at the time residency was five years before someone could naturalize as a citizen. Um, <clears throat> and Jewish immigrants also were able to leave Palestine and come back and remain citizens, where as for Arabs who left after a certain uh, number of years, they would not be able to come back in and claim citizenship. Um, and I know I'm, I'm close to running out of time, so I'll just, perhaps in the, in the question and answer, we can bring this more up to how is this a legacy. Um, but certainly by the 1950s, when Israel introduces its citizenship law and strips non-Jewish Palestinian Arabs of their Palestinian citizenship, so those who became refugees, um, this was very much based on the kind of ideology that the British used to create its own citizenship law. Um, but there was also this belief in race that linked with citizenship. So the Israelis also felt that because Palestinian Arabs were racially Arab, if they went to Arab majority countries, they could easily adapt and become nationals of, of those territories in the neighboring Arab states. So there is still very much after the 1950s, 
this legacy of imperial understandings of what race meant and how it should be linked to nationality for the Arabs as well as for those who become Israeli citizens in, in Israel after 1948. Thank you. Um, my turn. I just, uh, I'd like to start by thanking Mandy and Mahmoud for the fantastic job they did um, in making this day happen. And I, I want to say it, it's a curious place to be, the last speaker of a long um, day of historians speaking. And I just want to take a second and have a, have a moment together. Aren't historians fantastically interesting people? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, um, yeah, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Stephen and Roberto and Salim, uh, our professor, um, and Lauren and Jacob and Avi um, for the incredible presentations that they made today with the inc intricate detail um, and such thoughtful uh, uh, commentary about the intricate detail. And I say that by way of introducing the fact that I don't have intricate detail to offer you. Um, <laughs> For a number of reasons. One is that the professors who spoke before me left me very little as far as uh, detail to give. Um, and number two is I think maybe I can play a different role today as a different kind of speaker. Um, and it'll be about Balfour, but it'll also be about sort of commemoration, what it means as historians commemorate. Um, because as we know, today is November 2nd, and it's 100 years since Balfour. But in a few weeks' time, it'll be December 11th, and it'll be 100 years since Allenby. And then a few weeks, a, a few days before that, it'll be November 29th, and it'll be, what, 70 years since the partition plan. And then next year, it'll be the Nakba War, and go on and on and on. So I want to make a sort of, uh, perhaps a conceptual intervention, if I will, and say, begin by saying that I'm not going to focus on structures of colonial power or British intentions or imperialism. Um, because I think my colleagues did that extremely and intricately well. And I have very little to offer as far as the British government, uh, British government's role in imperialism or Zionism um, has to say. But what I will try to do is talk about Palestinians um, and popular re and political responses from the time of the declaration and throughout mainly the mandate period. And through this kind of historical lens, I'll try to make contemporary connections. Because um, I think a lot of what has been done, not just today, but uh, over this sort of uh, Balfour frenzy, as I said in my introduction, is all about the British. And today, I want to say a little bit about us, because we happen to be in Palestine. Um, in general, I hope to shed some light for you about Palestinian history, the history of a people and our people's narrative. How did we and do we as a people respond in its own time? at the end of the war, and over the course of the subsequent century, how, do, how have we reacted and responded to British imperialism, Zionist settler colonialism, and, okay, that's enough, British imperialism, Zionist kettle, settler colonialism in uh, several ways. I understand that the imperial and colonial, as well as, as well as the settler colonial designs are of paramount and incredible interest, but as Lauren was speaking, I, I remembered something that I had read when I was, as historians do, trudging through archives um, about citizens um, and how in the 1920s, in the mandate period, there was a group of Palestinians in Mexico who were trying to return to their homeland, having only been gone for um, uh, several years, and they were rejected entry. Um, and that's, a, that's another ongoing Palestinian um, story. And they, they, were, they bombasted the newspapers, the local newspapers, with their story, and they put together a committee. Um, and that committee actually still exists in Mexico, and you'll find similar communities in Chile. Um, so it's really interesting that the imperial side of the story is profoundly interesting, but I think the Palestinian side of the story might have something, um, something else to offer uh, about the trajectory of history. Um, as long as we're only talking about imperialism, Palestinians are subjects with only a kind of reactionary agency in the narrative. And I don't presume to be able to tell you the whole of a Palestinian story, and I wouldn't with Salim Tamari in the room. Um, but to get us, I want to get us all to collectively think about what commemorations like this are about um, for the dates that I went over at the beginning. And in the coming months, how we're going to try to go about commemorating um, 
and how Palestine and the Palestinian people play a role in that. I should say that this is, an, this is not a monolith, nor is it a, a homogeneous Palestinian response. We are a complicated people. Responses to the structures of colonial power were sometimes engaged or imagined with a keen focus on the legacy of Balfour and how that was a clear impediment to national liberation. But reactions were also sometimes performed with a sense of purposeful denial about the implications of Balfour on what the British were actually doing. I say that to say that um, you can find stories in every period that prove that Palestinians were oblivious to Balfour or that Palestinians rejected Balfour or that Palestinians tried to work within the structures that were given to them um, uh, in, in the mandate and beyond. That doesn't mean that the, the, all of those lines happen at the same time. There's no one story to be told and it's important that we remember that um, because I said, as, as I said, it's a complicated narrative. Um, Rashid al-Khaldi described the actual mandate as an iron cage that left Palestinians only political decisions that he described as the best of the worst. One can extend this over the course of modern Palestinian history. But I suppose the question I would like to pose and humbly not answer today is has to do with these questions of interrogation, which is a self-interrogation on my part and critique of my own work. How little we might have to say about Palestinian narratives and how much this little we have to say is divorce, divorces our agency from the story. The cage that Rashid described is real enough, a prison in its metaphorical articulations as well as real and material. But, and this is the question I want to challenge myself and you with, who is centered epistemologically and politically in our discussions over the course of today and over the course of all of the commemorations that will be happening in the season that will precede us? I want to make this interjection um, focusing on three main areas, if not eras. As historians, we like to talk about eras, and I'm not sure I have the ability to do that, but I'll try. I'll wing it. Um, uh, and I want to give you a sense of what I imagine legacy to mean as far as what Balfour meant at the time and over the past hundred years. The first sort of question that I'll ask is about national home for Jewish people in the Holy Land, which is the promise, right? Number two is mandate era politics, and where we go from a national home to state formation, which can be considered preparation. And number three is legacy, settler colonial rule under a settler colonial state, which is implementation and a kind of presumed permanency. Um, so number one, the national home for Jewish people. Can we say that local Palestinian people in the era of imperial politics in the midst of post-war design understood the implications involved in the wording of the declaration? I'm not sure. I think uh, between 1917 and 1918 and 1919, um, when Salim mentioned the word oblivious, we were in the audience and I was thinking, but I thought I read about a protest that happened in 1918 and not 1919 and perhaps 1920. I'm not sure, of course those are important. Historians like dates, but I think, I wanna think um, in, in, in a, just a slightly sort of larger way and say that of course they understood it. It might have showed up differently over the course of a few years. And that's not a hugely audacious assumption to make. And I don't think it's audacious because I think Palestinian agency can and should be historicized. The working of the declaration became the wording in the actual text of the mandate, as all of my colleagues before me have said. It was adopted in the preamble nearly word for word. Um, so its legacy is material and very much a part of the history of materialism, of imperialism and colonialism, as well as the history of empire. But it's also about negation. And that wasn't very, mentioned very much today because this era, this national home or phase and not to trying not to be overdetermined in the way that I say this, is mainly about questioning Palestinian national identity or rejecting it and erasing it, which is a banal, as far as I'm concerned, Orientalist and racist question. So if we read the text, we read that the, what the British intended, civil and religious rights with a clear lack of a mention of political light rights for the Palestinian Arab population. They named the indigenous people of the land non-Jewish existing non-Jewish communities. So this was the politics of colonial control by the British and settler colonial design as presupposed by Zionist ideology. This is what international recognition means in the case of Palestine. 
but it's also about international non-recognition and began a historical le legacy of a defensive search for recognition on part of the Palestinians. That is, we were denied a national ethos and have been adamant about proving it ever since. This has been the main task of historians of the mandate period and beyond. That is, we were a people to prove that we are a national entity, which falls well, in, lo which falls well into the, in line with the next phase, which is the mandate era politics from when we go from a national home to state formation. And this period, as far as I can understand, is about modernity. It's about building a European nation in Palestine, but not for Palestinians. There were many reactions to the equations set up by the mandate in Balfour before him, including on a semi-official uh, level, uh, which included delegations to London, and on a popular level, which we can see materially by reading the papers or the archives and people rejecting. So this is where I, can, I wanna propose two lines of thinking about Palestinian politics. And obviously there are many colors within those two lines. That of recognition or seeking it, and that of rejection. So in the political capacity, there, was an, there were several Arab delegations to London. There were local political parties. Uh, there were people within institutions set up by the mandate government itself that were working to prove our national status or to show that nation building was also our right. But in my mind, and frankly, my mind, more importantly, November 2nd also became a date of infamy. Perhaps not in 1918 or 1919, but soon enough into the mandate period, there were riots every year on November 2nd. There were preparations for violent confrontations and street level mobilization. We know this because I've looked into the British archives and the police records and I see that their correspondent turns up a notch at the end of October because they know what's about to happen at the beginning of November. We also can look at the newspapers. There were editorials. Within you know, a few years into the mandate period, you see on November 2nd, across the board, editorials that commemorate, commemorate Balfour. Um, and there was also, looking at those same sources, a few days later, or weeks later, uh, reports about, um, about the riots that were happening in the streets. So clearly rejection, rejection was materially available um, pretty early on into the mandate period. Um, and people had, frankly, as far as I can read it, a keen awareness that one nation, uh, one nation state was being formed in order to erase a fully articulated national ethos. November 2nd became such an infamous day that even The Guardian a few weeks ago published an article um, that remembered November 2nd, 1932, which is a famous, uh, had a famous cartoon on the cover of it, um, which with, with a picture of Balfour um, talk, with uh, writing about the destruction of Palestine. So again, Perhaps we can read Palestinian history a little differently amongst these various lines and the abysses that, uh, between articulating and acting on rejection and seeking recognition. Both can happen at the same time. And at, so at times these lines might have even crossed. 1936 is one. At times they might have diverged. But it's important to think I see, uh, it's important to see that this, these lines not as black and white but as ever changing. This is where the mandate period and contemporary politics seem to be in good comparison with each other. And now we go on to the third component, which is settler colonial rule. And I ask the question, is this a permanent condition? So again, I go back to the mandate period. And from, very early, from the very early days of the British occupation of Palestine, which was, as my colleagues have said, went from uh, military occupation to civil administration, into the state building era, rejection, was it had a clear historical trajectory. Not starting in 1929, but perhaps more clear and articulated than ever in 1929. There were, cl with, with clear lines leading to the revolt in 1936, Palestinian resistance was both aimed at British colonialism and their sponsorship of Zionist settler colonialism. This is a story, uh, the story is told often that Palestinians didn't fight the British directly or were fighting in order to stop Jewish immigration, or were only targeting Zionist institutions. But I'm asking for us to have a closer and more 
a nuanced look at the entirety of this and see that moments like 1929, which is one that I've done a lot of work on, and reading the sources to look for these kind of lines of rejection and recognition, one can see that while maneuvering occurred, 19, the 1929 moment was clear, and it was a clear scream, if you will, by, the, at, by a popular scream at several layers of power, including Pal the Palestinian political establishment, those seeking recognition, um, and Bri British, uh, the British establishment and the nascent uh, sub uh, Zionist in institutions. People were fighting colonialism in the form of the British and settler colonialism in, form in the form of Zionist establishment. So now I just, by way of conclusion, want to ask how, are, how is this sort of humble, very humble, I admit, historical interjection affect the way that we go about speaking about legacies and promises in 2007? I don't honestly know, but I want to sort of have, uh, ask a few questions that have more to do about how we think than what we're thinking. And I think one of, the, one of, the, one of my obsessions is that Palestinian politics is an interesting mix. But if we read beyond seeking recognition, we can see rejection. And we can see how does that affect the way that we see Palestinian agency over the course of history in order to be able to understand what brought us to this moment that we live in now. And I want to sort of ask a rhetorical question about the Making It Right um, movement that came out, that is coming out of London. That is a lot of things, but one of it is it's, uh, it's moving towards demanding a, a, a British apology. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure what that would do, to be honest, but it does sort of get me into thinking, you're asking a former empire to apologize for their imperialism. And I'm not sure if that's just another form of settler re uh, seeking recognition, but at the same time, it can also be about rejection, protests and conferences like today. But it can be about opportunities of opening up spaces that might be a little bigger than the ones that we live in. Because this line of comparison I see happening with other indigenous people who deal with different forms of rejection. The politics of recognition is an internal indigenous debate. And we can see it play out on the nation state level, look at Canada and Australia, and we can also see it play out on the international level with everything that came up to and came after the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, and that's really all I have to say. I just, I just wanted to once again say that I truly appreciated all of the presentations that came before me with all the incredible, interesting information, and I just tried right now to, to try and frame it in whatever humble way I could. So thank you very much. Well, thank you all. <clears throat> I think we've had three fascinating, uh, really, talks. And uh, I think the echoes with the presence are quite amazing uh, and, and disturbing, of course, how, how consistent is, especially uh, with this uh, nationality law and, and the family reunification uh, problems and, and the right of return and all of that. I want us to turn to the future, and I want to ask you if you wish to uh, comment on, on the following, that it has been suggested that the discussion around the centenary of the Balfour marks the end of the British consensus on Israel. The Shadow Foreign Secretary, Emily Thornberry, for example, has called on the United Kingdom to mark the centenary of the Balfour Declaration with a formal recognition of, uh, 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 formal British recognition of the state of Palestine. Would you agree? I mean, it's, it's a political question. Anybody? Do you want me to start? The word recognition was used, so they all looked at me. Um, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I think what's happening, and Avi pointed this out very eloquently, so I'm not going to try and, and, and repeat what Avi said, but I think what's happening in Britain in the past year or so has been terribly interesting between... Um, Theresa May's government and Jeremy Corbyn. And I think Corbyn is um, a really interesting phenomenon. Um, and it speaks to internal politics, but it speaks to 2017. And it speaks to um, where we're at right now with regards to justice, understanding justice. And I'm not sure that justice is equivalent with recognizing a Palestinian state. I just, I, I'm not sure what recognizing a Palestinian state in the, in the status that we're in right now would do, to be completely um, honest. 
Um, and, but I do think, it, it, not to use the word recognition, but talking about justice uh, with regards to the Palestinian people is of paramount importance. And it is a change um, or a, a noticeable change in politics. And that's not to say that that hasn't always been the case, because it has, but it's sort of coming up to the surface of things right now. And I would, I would turn to my colleagues who live there to be able to explain to me why it is that is the case. But I do think that justice and not state recognition is far, and that, that as well as happening in the public sphere is, is terribly interesting. Go ahead, you guys live there. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's why talking about the Battle for the Declaration, one of the many reasons why it's very important, because in a way what you're doing is you're, you're getting to the very roots of what we mean when we talk about historical justice and injustice. Um, in the Palestine situation, so it brings up all of those key issues, particularly in the British context, where they're not always openly aired. I mean, to answer your question, Raja, I think for quite a long time, a lot of people in Britain, at a grassroots level, have had some kind of basic recognition of the injustices that Palestinians have suffered historically and continue to suffer. The issue is when you go higher up the political food chain, to find that actually politics has long been locked into, for various reasons, an almost instinctive knee-jerk support um, of, of Israel and its, and its actions. So there's very much that disjuncture in Britain at the moment between ordinary people, who, as, a, as a large generalization, often are very aware of Palestinian, uh, the basics at least of Palestinian um, uh, injustice. But then I think it is also important to talk about the imperialist context in, within Britain, for example. I'm going to tell you something quite depressing now, so get ready for it. I, I teach, uh, in, I go as part of my uh, role as a lecturer at a British University, I go out and give talks um, and workshops with school kids who are 16, 17, preparing to apply for university. And I have this kind of fixed session that we do on the Balfour Declaration, and we go through the Declaration and try and understand it as a historical document. But I always start those sessions by asking the kids in the room, talk about 16, 17-year-olds, how many of you have ever heard of the Balfour Declaration? And typically, out of a class of around 20, one or two will put their hand up. That's good. <coughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad Raja found it less depressing than I do. Well, I don't have too much to add to that. Um, it's all still quite depressing to me, the sort of level of governmental ability to recognize the state of Palestine, even though, I mean, the British government has been very much in support of a two-state solution, you know, up front for many years now. Um, and so recognition of Palestine statehood as sort of an apology for Balfour, I, I just, I mean, certainly it would be a discourse to begin uh, having, but then after that, I'm not sure how far, as Rana and others have said, the government would be willing to go to implement some sort of justice. And this is a thorny issue in other places as well. Um, Canada in particular with, uh, with the indigenous population there and also Australia. Um, I think the only thing that we can perhaps hope for as a sea change would be if um, there was any chance for Jeremy Corbyn to, to get into power because he seems a bit um, more on the side of making apologies. I think he apologized for Tony Blair's war crimes, so why not for um, the Balfour Declaration? But yeah, that's, let's see if anything more positive happens. I wonder if Evie would like to uh, comment on the, uh, that it marks the end of the consensus on, in the British public. Thank you. I, I think uh, the events in Britain today uh, do mark the end of consensus in one respect that hasn't been touched on, and that is a consensus between the ruling elite and the people. Um, there is a complete disconnect in Britain between the ruling elite and the public on this subject. And I have been completely astonished by the interest that there is in the Balfour Declaration this year. 
I've given about um, a dozen talks and interviews, and I must have turned down about 25 invitations to give talks, mostly in British universities. And I attribute this to the fact that there is a growing understanding uh, of the injustice that has been done to the Palestinians all along, and the historic part that Britain has done in committing this um, injustice. And um, Jacob's students may not have heard of the Balfour Declaration, but a large number of British people have heard and care about it. This is reflected in the huge expansion of the number of branches of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign throughout um, the country. It's also reflected in the growing support for BDS. Here again, there is a very clear disjunction between the Theresa May government and the general public. Theresa May, in her uh, speech to the Conservative Friends of Israel, referred to BDS, and she said, we'll have no truck with it. The government had do adopted the definition of anti-Semitism um, by the international, remem uh, international um, Holocaust Remembrance Association, which is a completely preposterous um, de definition. And um, I have a much simpler definition, which is anti-Semitism is the hatred of Jews as Jews. Uh, but the government is extremely, in every way, pro-Israeli. The definition is one thing, the forbidding of local authorities to spend money or to support BDS um, and introducing uh, legislation is another example. So it seems to me that there is the end of consensus between the political elite and the public. Thank you, Avi. Uh, what you said at the end brings to mind the South African case, where the government was the last to come along with the uh, anti-apartheid and so on. Mm. Uh, we have 10 minutes for questions. Please ask uh, brief questions to, to uh, either direct them to one or all the uh, panelists. Bernard. There is a, another conference on the Balfour Declaration taking place <coughs> today in the Israel Academy. Uh, they can't hear you you can't hear them, which leads me to ask all of you to just speculate very briefly as to whether you think we are all doomed to remain imprisoned within nationalist historical narratives or whether it is possible to conceive of a common historical narrative. Who would like to start? Are we going to take a bunch of questions and then answer, or you can take a few one at a time? Okay, let's take a few questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, question for Abarakat. You started talking about historical legacies, and you, I understood you as saying that um, from all these successive commemorations, which you listed, there are four or five coming this month, is all we have from this legacy is commemoration. Is? Is commemoration. I mean, things are happening, but all we have is commemoration. I, that's what I understood you saying, but you did not develop this idea, and I wish you could say something about it. It reminds me of Tafiq Zayad's famous uh, uh, saying that uh, they have geography and we have history. Yeah. Is this what you meant, or maybe not? You can okay. say something about it. Let's give the chance to the panelists to answer. Who, who would like to go first? Maybe the last one. Uh, last goes first. Yeah. Um, I think, Salim, uh, I think what I was trying to say is, Yanni, I want to develop this more, obviously, but I think what I was trying to say is I don't want it to only be about commemoration. Um, and it, it was a, a warning for myself and, and all of us um, because we're in the seasons of it right now. And so what does that mean? And your paper goes, uh, what you said, goes, some, uh, goes towards the opposite, which is talking about people and the places and the context in which they were acting. Um, 
uh, and it was about how we commemorate and, and what we're doing in the in this commemoration process. Um, so it was about, that was the intervention. And I'd like to, to no, speak yeah. to Professor yeah. Wasserstein. Um, more than 10 years ago, I was a TA. Um, I think it was like 12 years ago, I was a TA in a course of yours. I was your teaching assistant. And I think we had a similar conversation at the time. Um, so I'd like to remind you of it. And I think what we, what we, what we don't lack is, it, I don't think we have a problem of lacking dialogue. Um, I don't think the Israeli Academy, I, I think we know, I know what the Israeli Academy has to say, because I read their work, and I think if they bother to read my work, they'll know what I have to say. I think it's about frameworks. Um, and this isn't about two competing nationalisms, and it never has been. Um, it might look like that right now, um, but I think this is about what everybody before me was talking about. This is legacies of imperialism and um, legacies of settler colonialism uh, and uh, a present a settler colonial present. And I think that framework is, um, is how I understand what's going on right now. Yeah, again, I don't have too much to add. I think Rana summed it up quite well. Um, but to address, is, again, this idea of two, are we stuck in two nationalist boxes? Um, <clears throat> I've been glad to see in this day's workshop and presentations that there is quite a lot of nuance and I think that's one of the advantages of having you all listen to a bunch of historians who are quite skilled in trying to to develop these nuances a bit more rather than just look at competing nationalist movements um, and so I can't speak for what's going on on um, with the Israeli Academies conference but it's also important to look at how these legacies of colonialism imperialism settler colonialism the response to the Arabs, the response to the Zionists, informed and framed both nationalist movements, that they weren't sort of statically set on one nationalist goal, um, which didn't change from 1917 to 1948. I mean, there was so much sort of influence back and forth throughout, and that's something that I think um, would be well worth exploring more rather than just trying to conceptualize things on one side or the other. But. Again, I completely agree with, with Rana. I don't see anything nationalist about this panel or the first one. Um, so the, a, a challenge was made to the argument I was putting forward just very briefly. I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying the text of the Balfour Declaration is the direct result of this kind of new imperialist strand. I'm trying to understand what's the bigger ideological context that allows that declaration to become the bedrock of British policy in Palestine all the way through the interwar years, despite you know, several flashpoints where it is seriously reconsidered and above all challenged on the ground by, by Palestinians. Um, and just on that, on that point, I suppose, to, as a way to perhaps link some of the things that Lauren and I are talking about and then Rana's presentation, I think what really stands out to me is the extent to which Britain underestimated Palestinian resistance to the Balfour Declaration and its implementation. Because as has been pointed out, the Balfour Declaration is one of several propagandistic statements and, and policies that are coming out of the British war machine during the First World War in the Middle East, including after the coming into occupation of, of, of Jerusalem and the southern Palestine, several attempts to support Arab nationalist activities in Palestine itself. It seems almost unbelievable to think of it now. People like Mohammed Amin al-Husseini, um, who later becomes the leader of the Palestinian movement here, was helping the British to recruit volunteers for the Arab National Army during the First World War. Britain was helping societies such as Nadi al-Arabi here in the Jerusalem area in that same period, all because there was this very paternalistic idea that these nationalist movements, these proto-nationalist movements, could be controlled and manipulated to British interests. And there's an incredibly kind of patronizing um, element of that imperialistic thought that we see there. And they simply didn't gauge, they simply didn't understand the strength of Palestinian resistance that was coming and that continues to, to go on to this day. And they and the Israelis still underestimate yeah. to this day. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all the speakers for really great presentations, which I've learned a lot from. And thank you all. For <clears throat> Thank you very much. We know that we can't undo history. We know that fairness is not always served, and we know that our struggle, is though unique to us, is not unique in history. It's a chapter in the colonization of the Middle East in the hands of the superpower. 
I'm glad that today we managed to discuss several aspects and several sides of the Balfour Declaration and the British misbehaving in the Middle East. <laughs> and for that, I'm grateful for the input of the speakers. I'm also grateful for the presence and uh, of the audience through your engagement and through your questions and comments. Mandy have flattered me at the beginning with an overrated appraisal of me. So may I say that you, Mandy, have left a real footprint through your work at the Canyon Institute. You have earned a space for yourself in Jerusalem as a true Jerusalemite. And though I'm not the one who gives certificates or club membership to Jerusalem, I must say working with you was a pleasure and it gave us so much meaning to what we actually do. Again, <laughs> thanks to our founders, the British Council in Palestine. Thank you for your genuine support that for this perfect. conference. <laughs> Equally, thanks for the staff of the National Theatre, the true beacon of culture for us here in Jerusalem. For those asking about the film and the recordings of the conference, it will be available through our social media. Please do ask me and get in touch if you have any further inquiries. Now my sales hat is on. Books are available outside, and the authors will be happy to sign any copies. Thank you again. Have a nice evening, and thanks again. <laughs> Wonderful. Really great uh, insight. Thank you. Thank you. Very good.